I, I'm sure everyone's here uh, to see the Jan Egeland video, right? I'm sure that's what, what brought everybody here. I laughed until I cried, but I, I'm Dan Rundy. I'm uh, going to ask the panelists to take a seat. Um, the conversation we're going to have today is on the study of the impact of uh, donor counterterrorism measures on principled humanitarian action. That's quite a mouthful, but I think if you're in this room, you know what the issue is, is how do you balance the very legitimate issue of, of protecting ourselves from the bad guys while also trying to be to answer the very principled and also equally important issue of, of doing good in the world in some really difficult and complicated places. Uh, and in a world of globalization, in a world of diasporas, uh, in a world of, of money that crosses borders uh, electronically, uh, in the world of global civil society, this has gotten harder and harder. And so I know this is a particularly salient issue for the development community, for the humanitarian response community. I think the study that was done um, that you have a copy of, I think is particularly interesting. Um, our friends at Interaction and our friends at the Norwegian Refugee Council helped make this event possible. Um, and I think we've got a very interesting mix of speakers. So I'm going to ask the panelists to come up and, and, and have a seat. But before the panelists start, I'm going to ask my friend um, Sam Worthington, who's the head of Interaction, to say a few words. Sam, if you'd come up. As I said, we're, we're, the good news is we have a new building. The bad news is we're still working out some of the AV issues. We have handheld mics, so it's a little bit like karaoke night at CSIS. So, Sam. So good morning, and uh, thank you, Dan, uh, and welcome uh, to what should be uh, an interesting and thoughtful dialogue. Um, I'd like to start with just a simple observation. Ultimately, from a humanitarian perspective, this is about saving lives. Uh, it's about the ability to help people in the most vulnerable uh, circumstances, uh, but often environments that are in, have incredible uh, security challenges. And I think that the challenge here is how do we, in terms of the U.S. government, uh, advance our national security uh, while not putting humanitarian programs at risk? And what is the tension between uh, this advancing of our national security uh, and humanitarian uh, imperatives? Um, but I think this, this framing of either or is not the best uh, framing. It really is ultimately our can we have uh, counter-terror policies which need to exist without the unintended consequences of the implementation or the design of those policies being such that they impact uh, the lives of humanitarian workers or uh, the programs that they're trying to deliver. Uh, I'm humbled every day by the type of work uh, that is done uh, by the individuals uh, on our panel, whether it's uh, uh, within the U.S. government, uh, the U.N. system, uh, or humanitarian NGOs operating on the ground. Um, as we know, humanitarian principles and the concepts uh, that uh, underlie them have been reaffirmed by the U.S. government for decades. Um, and this idea that we can provide assistance to individuals in the greatest need, no matter who they are, uh, and this impartial preference to the individual who needs the help, not based on some political interest one way or the other. Um, it is only because of this that we're able to operate in places like Syria, Somalia, uh, Afghanistan and other places outside of the security wire because the security for the NGO community comes through the trust that has been established with local communities, the dialogue we have with all actors, and the reality that we could only implement programs uh, if we have their trust. Um, so I think it's, it's finding uh, a sense of, and this is the heart of it all, is are the unintended consequences of uh, our national security approaches to counterterror uh, resulting in humanitarian actors being seen as an extension of U.S. intelligence or U.S. In security uh, apparatus? Uh, and if we are seen as an extension, uh, whether intended or not, how do we operate in environments where the very lives of our staff 
uh, are at stake and the essence of the programs you want to deliver uh, is harmed. Um, that tension between needing to make sure the resources don't go to the bad guy, needing to make sure that assets are controlled, and at the same time providing enough space for humanitarian actors to operate as impartial uh, actors, that is the tension that we're drawing uh, here. Uh, we've been in a dialogue with the U.S. government uh, for many years now. Uh, I think in this ongoing dialogue we've come to a pretty good understanding that there is uh, a operational common ground here, um, but that this uh, and how to implement it uh, country by country and are there norms that we can uh, apply uh, and remembering where I started that ultimately this is about human lives our ability to save lives and our ability to ensure uh, that uh, we have a wallet interaction that has uh, several hundred names on it that that wall does not expand uh, with more individuals killed uh, doing their work going forward so I look forward for a thoughtful uh, and provocative dialogue by the panel and thank you to CSIS for, for making this possible Thanks very much, Sam. Okay, panelists, please come on up. I think you all have or will have copies of their, their bio shortly. Uh, Valerie Amos is the Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and the Emergency Relief Coordinator at the United Nations. Uh, Ambassador Dan Freed uh, is the Coordinator of Sanctions Policy at the U.S. State Department. Uh, Jan Egeland, who needs no introduction, but is also uh, the head of the Norwegian Refugees Council in his current life and Ambassador Bill Garvelink, who is here at CSIS, uh, who has an affiliation here, but is also the for former head of OFDA at USAID and is also the former ambassador uh, to the Congo, but also wears a hat now at the International Medical Corps as well. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Valerie Amos to, to kick it off and, and to share a little bit about the report as well as and some a additional comments from Jan Agla, and then we'll hear from Ambassador Fried and then from Ambassador Garvelink. Uh, Ms. Amos, over to you. Uh, thank you very much and um, can I also, uh, Dan, thank you and uh, also Sam for uh, bringing us all together this morning and also thank uh, my fellow uh, panellists and uh, I think that this conversation could not have come at a better time really because these are issues which are uh, very, very current in a world where we are seeing uh, the spread of uh, terrorist uh, activity uh, and where there are concerns across uh, government in practically uh, every part of the world. But I really want to underline something that uh, Sam said at the beginning in his introductory remarks, which is uh, I don't think that any of us sees any inherent contradiction uh, between uh, countries that have uh, very legitimate uh, security concerns and the aims of uh, counter-terrorism measures and the aims of principled humanitarian action. What we are both seeking to do is to protect people from harm. States have a legitimate right and responsibility to protect their people from acts of terrorism and for us on the humanitarian side any attacks directed against uh, civilians, including acts of terrorism, are a reprehensible violation of the most basic precepts of human rights and international law. Uh, we are also both concerned about uh, preventing aid diversion. That is an important, I think, point of convergence between humanitarian organizations uh, and also many countries. We on the humanitarian side do everything that we can to ensure that life-saving assistance does not further the belligerent aims of any party to a conflict, whether or not they are designated as terrorists. And can I uh, say to you that uh, doing uh, risk analyses, working on uh, monitoring, all of this uh, is very much part and parcel of the work that we do on a daily basis. And over many years of operating in conflict zones, we've developed robust and increasingly effective systems for managing uh, risks. Uh, I'm not in any way saying that more cannot be done uh, to better demonstrate uh, the impact of the work that we have done and the work that we continue 
uh, to deal with uh, on managing uh, those risks uh, and also that sometimes uh, we don't need to strengthen uh, that work but I think that there is a lot that has been done that we don't talk about uh, enough. So there is a sh uh, an extent to which there is a shared uh, interest here. Diversion of assistance from its intended beneficiaries not only the concern of counter-terrorism uh, actors. It's also the major concern of us uh, doing humanitarian work. And it's also a contradiction of, to the basic aims and principles of humanitarian action. But there's a but, and of course there has to be a but, and it's a pretty big one. Uh, because where the tension comes is in relation to some other core principles that are absolutely fundamental and vital to our work. And every single day, those principles are coming under attack and are at risk. Because the world in which we are operating today is uh, more complex. Uh, we are seeing less conflict uh, between states and much of the body of law that has been uh, developed has been uh, to monitor what happens in conflicts between states and we are seeing more and more conflict uh, within states with non-state armed groups. Uh, and there are two absolutely crucial uh, principles which are under threat uh, uh, for us in terms of some of these uh, counter-terrorism measures. One is uh, our work to strive to help people wherever they are, whoever they, uh, they support. It is without uh, political uh, bias. And that's very hard for us to argue, not just uh, with governments in countries where, uh, in their terms, they have you know, armed groups and terrorists trying to uh, overturn what they're trying to do, but also because you have uh, countries which support uh, others. The other is that assistance aimed at preserving life with dignity is provided on the basis of need alone. And I could not tell you how much we are under attack with respect to that uh, principle. We have uh, governments of countries in which uh, we work, basically not wanting us to work in areas uh, which are on, under the control of others. We have the groups in those uh, areas not wanting us to give uh, uh, aid to uh, groups of people that uh, they see as being against uh, their aims. Even now, right now in Syria, we have communities that are besieged um, in areas that are either under the control of government or under the control uh, of the opposition, and we have not been allowed in for months to give uh, life-saving uh, aid. It is an absolute scandal. But these fundamental principles of humanity and impartiality, they're at the very heart of what we do as humanitarian workers. And if they are undermined, uh, there is very little place uh, for us uh, to go. And I think it's important to remember that the United States and other member states of the United Nations have played an absolutely critical historical role in developing those principles, principles which are actually some of them older than the United Nations itself. Um, so the, the, the test becomes how do we continue to apply those principles in these extremely complex uh, emergencies? The study which was commissioned by my own organization, Archer, and also with uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council, found that in some cases, counter-terrorism measures have made our job much more difficult. Where designated groups are active, it's been more difficult to respond to people and meet their needs wherever they are. It's been more difficult to respond only according to need. While the impact of counter-terrorism measures varies across different situations in different countries, the, the study outlines a number of them. Halts in funding, suspension of programs, delays in the delivery of assistance, restrictions on the provision of assistance to particular people or groups, and fear and self-censorship on the part of humanitarian actors themselves. And uh, two very quick examples, and how am I doing on time? Okay. Um, the first is the response to the 2011 famine in Somalia. 
while many UN agencies and NGOs were being expelled by al-Shabaab and that in itself told uh, a story because many of the communities in which those organizations were working wanted the organizations to stay because the trust had been established they had seen the work that the organizations were doing and uh, the positive impact that it had uh, on uh, their communities so that was an extremely reprehensible act which had severe consequences for order Som uh, ordinary Somalis Islamic NGOs reported difficulty receiving project funds due to counter-terrorism related restrictions on financial transactions the remittance system on which communities have relied so heavily uh, which Oxfam recently found to be comparable in scale to the US government's annual humanitarian and development assistance was also considerably uh, affected and in fact we are still trying right now to keep the systems open in Somalia that will enable those remittances uh, uh, to flow in. The study also found that the significant decrease in funding available from main, major donors in the period following the designation of al-Shabaab as a terrorist group was a constraint on early action in response to the crisis. Now I I want to stress because there was a huge fuss when uh, this report uh, came out about what happened in Somalia at the point of, of uh, the famine. The study did not find that delay or suspension of donor funding was the primary cause of the famine in Somalia. It was not. But what the study did find was that difficulties in accessing funding due to counter-terrorism measures were one significant factor inhibiting the response. And of course, al-Shabaab's own actions, expelling humanitarian organizations, also played its part. Many donors, including the United States, did change some policies and put in place certain <coughs> exemptions for humanitarian assistance once the immense scale of the crisis was clear. This helped us to scale up our operations uh, towards the end of 2011. But one clear lesson is that we must work together to ensure that the appropriate humanitarian exemptions are put in place at the earliest possible stage, that they are clearly understood and communicated and that they cover the broadest possible range of act actors. It's all about trying to uh, think about at the beginning what might be the unintended consequences of our actions. Uh, a second example involves the difficulties engaging with designated groups in the occupied Palestinian territories. In the Gaza Strip, the no or limited contact policies imposed by different donors with the de facto authorities seriously affects the quality of programs and the ability of organizations to respond according to needs. Program design suffers from the lack of data and statistics that are only available from the authorities. Programs are also discontinued. For example, a distribution of food and non-food items to 2,000 families was not carried out because the donor did not authorize the implementing organization to share the list of beneficiaries with the authorities. It must be emphasized that contact with groups designated as terrorists does not confer them any type of recognition or legitimacy. What I say all the time uh, to member states who come up uh, with this concern is that we talk to anyone if it helps us to get to the people who need our help and support. Um, so there are major domestic political considerations and we really have to bear this in mind uh, which are impacting our ability to do our work and we're not naive about the political environment in which we work but there's got to be a degree of trust here about the job that we have been mandated to do by the international uh, uh, community trust that we can actually do our job in the terms in which we've been asked uh, to do it um, it's not an issue that's unique to the United States or indeed to American humanitarian actors. The study found a number of different countries with regulations and policies that limit engagement and negotiation with groups designated as terrorists or that prevented the provision of assistance to people associated with terrorism. Encouragingly, it also found a number of areas of good practice among donors, including here in the United States, that needs to be shared and replicated. Just one more thing before I finish, because I saw you look no, okay. at your watch. <laughs> the policy dialogue that we are seeking to further here today uh, 
can't be limited just to a US audience. I'm delighted that we're doing this today. I think it's very important that we have this conversation here in the United States. But it also has to take place between states in multilateral fora. In the United Nations, with our NGO partners and others. Um, issues that we might think through uh, that dialogue and discussion include a more coordinated approach to counter-terrorism clauses with, within funding agreements, exemptions for humanitarian action within sanctions regimes, measures to ensure that financial regulations do not necessarily impede the work of legitimate <coughs> charities. But we as the humanitarian community have also got uh, some lessons uh, to learn. Because what is very clear from the example of both Somalia and the occupied Palestinian territory is that donor counterterrorism legislation and restrictions in funding agreements have had what we call a chilling effect. Operational decisions are not necessarily made strictly according to need, but to minimize organizations' exposure to criminal liability and reputational risk. The minute we start going down that road, we start splitting our community and pitting ourselves one against the other. Uh, the lack of clarity around the application of some, some counterterrorism measures have contributed in some cases to an environment of fear and self-censorship self as a response to counterterrorism uh, measures. We can't afford to operate like that. We must change this environment by continuing the open and honest uh, dialogue that I hope we've initiated today and that will continue. And my apologies for s talking for slightly too long. No, this is very important. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Egelin, I'm going to hand the mic over to you now. Thank you. <coughs> Maybe I'll stand up so I see. Thanks, Dan. Thanks to CSIS and to Interaction for, for having us of this very important discussion. I'm delighted to be here uh, with uh, Valerie, Daniel, Bill, uh, old friend from uh, my own time in the UN. I come to this uh, from two angles, as many others come here. I was uh, for seven years the Deputy Foreign Minister of Norway, and I saw very clearly that the whole, one of the whole purposes of government is to defend its citizens against <coughs> threats, domestic and international one. And the creeping threat of terror is one that has really challenged modern government the most. In my own country, Norway, which is one of the hardest hit countries of the Western Hemisphere the last 10 years from terror, two years ago uh, s uh, more than 70 uh, youth were massacred in one day by political extremists, my daughter was supposed to be at the island, I was supposed to speak at the island. Uh, children of uh, my friends, friends of my children, were murdered by the terror terrorists. So, and the, and, the, and, and the whole lesson was the country was not prepared, the government had not really made what it should. And the whole policies are changed from, from, from A to Z. It's a little bit <coughs> like 9-11 in the United States. Now, I also come to this from the other angle. I've been to in humanitarian work for, for th you know, 35 years, since I was uh, a 19 year old as a volunt uh, voluntary with Catholic organization in guerrilla controlled area of Colombia, Latin America. Today, I'm in charge of the Norwegian Refugee Council with 4,000 staff in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Colombia, uh, Somalia, all of the bad places. The reason we get money from Washington to Oslo, from Stockholm to London and uh, the EU, Australia, Canada and so on, is that we're very good at delivering services to the most needy in the crossfire where terror and bad militias are at their worst. That's the vote of confidence of the donors over all of these years. So naturally, it makes us very nervous, as Valerie has said, and as we document in this common report that is before you, that many of the same, uh, same friends, donor friends, including the US, but not exclusively the US, it's the, it's the UK, it's Canada, Australia, Denmark, come with laws that has the unintended consequences that it is more difficult now 
to help precisely the same civilians, women and children and refugees, in that crossfire. It, it, it cannot be the, 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 the intention of the lawmakers, and it has to be rectified. Because it's going to get worse. It's not going, going to get better. It's going to get worse. We're seeing this with the pilots that have been implemented. You know, it, it's going to be more and more difficult. Now, the, um, we live in these different places by our appearance as being there to help those in greatest needs and not being party to the political conflict. We do not represent any party to a conflict. The moment we're seen as being representative of this or that side, or this or that political actor, we're out of there, basically. Because we're, not, we're unarmed, we're vulnerable, we're, we, we are easily taken. Uh, and let me give a, 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 some examples of, of what we're talking of. Uh, my organization had to turn back uh, to very generously uh, provided million dollars from here, this government, to Dadaab camp, the greatest, largest, in many ways most miserable, miserable refugee camp on earth. It's for Somali refugees in Kenya. We asked for the money to build um, 2,250 latrines and to maintain another 1,100 latrines and to do youth education work for more than 100,000 youth. When we were asked to hand over the CVs of, of our staff and our partners, of course we had to say no. The moment it would be known that, you know, did you know that the NRC is handing over our CVs to you know who? And then next is, of course, do you know that the NRC is now operating on behalf of you know who? We would be targets. Uh, my predecessor was attacked and nearly killed on her way to Dadaab in a convoy just a year or, or, or so ago and colleagues were killed by Al-Shabaab. What we do not need is measures that make it more difficult for us to work in, our, in, in, in Dadaab, where we provide hope for a lot of youth who have a lot of opportunities to go to extremism, we give them other hope. Please do not make it more difficult for us to work in that up. In Afghanistan, uh, colleagues, American, European, other colleagues, are now uh, among that hope for something good beyond the drawdown of military forces. Again, we live by our ability to maintain political well, to, to maintain contacts with political and other actors that we share nothing other with than the hope that we can help the women and children out there in the field. Um, to be tainted as being part of the political struggle is, is a sure end to that lifeline for these people that we all want to help. In, uh, in, pla in, in a place like Syria, the, uh, Valerie mentioned, which is the, in a way, the, in, in my view, the generational challenge. We haven't had such a bad disaster since the 1990s. It's, it's worse since the turn of the millennium. You cannot do anything inside Syria without negotiating with, uh, having contact with very bad types some with links to the West, some with links to the Gulf, some with links to uh, the, the regime, with links to Russians, what not. They're all bad. They're all bad. And we have to deal with them. It cannot be... M m uh, <laughs> we need to be helped to survive. Uh, the um, Islamic organizations that we need to have as partners are even more vulnerable to all of this. 
And if the Islamic organizations, our partners, are paralyzed, we're paralyzed. Uh, <coughs> another example, I think, where the report is, is Palestinian areas. I mean, there is now a lot of self-censorship. Everybody's scared, you know, among, among uh, NGOs. Scared of money not being there anymore. You know, we're, we're dependent on, on donors that ask uh, us to do things. One of my favorite examples from the report is, is this NGO who said, oops, we have to stop feeding these toddlers in these kindergartens because the headmasters may be affiliated to this organization that these donors do not like. You know, when did toddlers become, you know, po political entities? Toddlers are toddlers and they need food if they are hungry. Uh, the, these are the consequences we read of in the report. Now, ending, ending. What do we ask for? Well, we ask for dialogue. And I think we'll have a meeting today with friends uh, in the US government to, to discuss what do we do? Because we have a common goal here. We want to help these people. We want to be against terror and we want to be in favor of assistance to very vulnerable people. How can we work together to avoid the unintended consequences of all of this? We, we need to uh, have uh, exceptions, exemptions for humanitarian work in this crossfire. Since 1860s, when the International Red Cross was created, we have survived by being impartial, uh, um, independent, and being the uh, inter ara, uh, arma caritas, as it says in Latin, between arms, uh, uh, compassion. Between the two sides, compassion. Um, this exemption has to be given so we can continue. And you have to, finally, you have to have trust in our own due diligence measures. And maybe I'll just say that what we, the list is long, but what do we do as the NRC and our US and other partners? We do systematic needs assessments before delivery. We monitor and have site visits all the time to see that it really goes to the beneficiaries. There is no uh, aid diversion. We have internal financial controls and procurement procedures with extensive checks and balances. We have extensive use of external audits, internal audits and evaluations. We have a staff uh, code of conduct where we really follow, control and vet our staff. We have anti-corruption policy and regu regulation and we have in internal screening and vetting, which is there, including personal interviews and reference checks with everybody, especially in these areas. And we are internally also vetting everybody vis-a-vis -vis the known lists of terrorists, because we really don't want to employ anybody who have a shady side. So we do vet them ourselves against the UN list, and here's the member states list that are there before us. We also have internal vetting of implementation, uh, implementing organization supplies over $20,000 already. And we have inclusion of standard counterterrorism clauses in contracts for all implementing partners. This is what we have done for so many years. I think this is what should be there as with all of the other high-quality organizations, um, uh, ha have the trust in us to continue our work as now. Thank you. Thank you, very much. Thank you Mr. Egelin. Thank you. My friend, Ambassador Freed from the State Department, please. Great. Um, Dan, thank you very much for organizing this. It's useful in this discussion. Well, the attendance here suggests, uh, demonstrates the importance of this issue and the um, intense interest and the import importance of the issue, the intense interest and the difficulty <coughs> of dealing with some of the problems that have been raised. And I appreciate what Sam Worthington said, plus Valerie Amos has remarked and 
Jan Egeland. So we're off to a good start. Um, I want to start with two basic propositions which outline um, the U.S. government's approach to this. One, the United States supports UN, NGO, and other international organization partners in their efforts to provide humanitarian assistance. And we do so mindful of the fact that where there are humanitarian needs, there is usually a lack of security. And there are various dangers on the ground. And that work is all the more noble for the circumstances under which it, it is carried out. There is an imperative, both a, both a policy imperative, but dare I say a moral imperative, to facilitate as best we can humanitarian aid to needy populations. In the real world, and in the real world, terrorist groups can be and are active on the ground. That's the real world, that's what we have to face. Now that's the first proposition. The second proposition is that counterterrorism policy is a deep, serious concern which also has the standing of an imperative. Jan Engeland sort of got everybody's attention talking about the real world <coughs> consequences of terrorism in Norway. Okay, that's right. Um, I was in the White House on 9-11, 2001. I spent the afternoon there in the Situation Room. And I, and I won't forget that afternoon either. So both objectives, the counterterrorism objective and the humanitarian objective are legitimate. Our job is to bring those together and deal with the consequences when you do. There are unintended consequences. And one of the laws of policy making is that it seems like a good idea when you write it down in a simple three-page decision document or an options memo. And then you deal with the consequences of what you didn't see. And I'm not a believer that human institutions are perfect. So we have to learn as we, we learn as we go. And we learn from things we could do better. We learn from our mistakes. We get smarter at things. So our job is to deal with the, unexpected, the unintended consequences in the real world. Now, one of the unintended consequences of having humanitarian and counterterrorism policies is, a bureaucratic, sto is bureaucratic stovepiping. In our system, when the humanitarian providers and policymakers and the counterterrorism people exist in their own worlds, in their own frame of references, you get less than, less than optimal results. We are addressing that. And in fact, we've done a lot to bring the groups together to address humanitarian consequences of counterterrorism decisions and to have the humanitarian people in the State Department, in AID, aware of the counterterrorism imperatives. Now, as an example, I'll cite two examples of how it can work. Democratic Republic of Congo, there was a great worry about M23 and a suspension of operations, of humanitarian operations, or on the other hand, a diversion of funds. We worked this through. We brought together humanitarian providers, policymakers, counterterrorism people, and op humanitarian operations were able to proceed unabated. Um, in Mali, Ansar al Din was, earlier this year, was a big problem for us. Uh, we dealt, we had learned lessons from the past, we dealt with humanitarian consequences, and again, we were able to work things out. A debate at the level of high principles makes for fireworks and good seminars where people shout at each other. It doesn't necessarily make for good results. Solutions in the real world are apt to be individualized, tailored, 
fitted to the circumstances to solve real world problems on the ground. They will not be pure in terms of theory. They can't be when you have two very different and legitimate objectives to reconcile. Policy making, if it's done right, is dealing, means dealing with the complicated, the imperfect, sometimes the inelegant, and stuff that doesn't always make for perfect op-eds or Sunday morning talk show presentations, but works. The measure should be, does it work on the ground? Does it help get food to people who need it while withholding resources from terrorist groups who want it? Um, there are all sorts of solutions and ways to approach problems. I don't know whether there are any uh, of my colleagues from the Treasury Department today, but I'm going to give a shout out to OFAC, um, which, for example, issued recently General License E for Iran, which authorizes NGOs to transfer up to half a million dollars to support humanitarian projects in Iran. This was a general license. There are also specific arrangements that are worked out on the ground. The United States provides about $5 billion annually for global humanitarian <coughs> assistance. That's a lot of money. Even these days when we're talking about budgetary cutbacks, that's a, that's a, a good chunk of change. That's good. I'm glad it's, it's out there. We provide resources around the world. We're a large bilateral donor. I believe the world's largest by a lot. It means that, that with that amount of money comes a great responsibility to get things right. Um, I liked the fact of the study. I liked even more the, con the conclusions of the study that suggested that dialogue and working out problems on the level of practicality is the way to go. I think that's right. There are, going to, there are risks. Working out solutions to difficult problems will take time. As we get better at it and as we learn to work together, it should take less and less time. My own office in the State Department is responsible for sanctions policy worldwide and what our, my office's job is, in theory, is to bring a strategic look at sanctions policy and to bring in from outside of the sanctions world different concerns. And I work with my Treasury colleagues who have already been doing this for some time. We want you, the NGOs and the UN organizations, to reach out to us with specific problems. I'd rather hear my office hear about them earlier than later. We want to be able to work on solutions in a practical way. I welcome this panel. I welcome the discussion. And I welcome the opportunity to make progress on some tough problems in a tough world out there. Thank you. Thanks, Ambassador. Okay, Ambassador Garveling. Okay, thank you. Um, I will make just a couple of short comments and offer a couple of suggestions. I hope I'm going to disagree just a little bit with my, my friend Dan on, on a few points. I've, uh, f I'm coming at this from spending most of my career in USAID and in the disaster business. So I've, I've dealt with these uh, <coughs> sanctions and some of the other counterterrorism measures for about the past 20 years when they first appeared, uh, some of the uh, material, uh, material provisions came in 94 and have expanded beyond that. And then with OFAC, it's been around since the 50s, I think, or if you look at some other legislation since, since the 40s. And, and we've experienced some, from my experience in the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, some, some difficulties. Now, 
uh, and we're, as Dan said, we're learning from experience and we learn as we go and that's the important part here and, and we're going to end up at the same place. But a couple of my concerns, and I'll just mention two, and one relate to sanctions and licenses and another uh, works with a partner, uh, another couple of comments on the partner vetting system and then a couple of suggestions. You know, the sanctions uh, are a difficult thing for most NGOs to deal with. As Dan mentioned, there's a general license and then there are specific licenses. And those licenses are a little bit different from the material support clauses. So there's a fair amount of disagreement or misunderstandings about what these are. And I think one thing that we can do uh, collectively is have a much better understanding of uh, just, just where we stand when those kind of licenses are being issued. I've heard myself when I was in the government and after you hear comments from the State Department and USAID that don't jive with what Treasury is telling you. And that puts NGOs in a very difficult position in terms of the risks they're, they're taking. And the speed with which licenses are issued, and I understand the care that has to be taken, but that's kind of a slow process. Uh, you get a general license and then ask for specific ones, and certainly in cases I've seen, it takes months to get them. That's too slow uh, for responding to humanitarian <coughs> imperatives and needs in, in a tough situation. Valerie mentioned Somalia, and of course th th this was a factor in, among many other things that, that delayed the international response uh, to Somalia. And there are ways to deal with that, but the result of the, the various licenses, the material support uh, division, provisions of other laws, and the way the licenses are, are issued results in a certain amount of confusion and uncertainty which leads to inaction and delayed response. And there, there are ways, I think, that can be, this can be speeded up, but it is a, a fact of life, or at least it has been from, from my experience. The other issue I just mentioned very briefly is the partner vetting system. This puts NGOs, as both Valerie and Jan have said, in an untenable position of having to do work on behalf of, of the United States government. And that, that doesn't make any sense, to me at least. And in fact, I guess one of the things that I've thought about for a long time is this, that we've got to synchronize our policies here. Uh, one of the pillars of U.S. foreign policy since I've been around is humanitarian assistance. We provided it in Armenia, we provided it in Iran with an earthquake, we're doing it in Syria now. And <coughs> the vetting uh, procedure uh, undermines that. Uh, one of the other things that has been uh, uh, a policy, certainly of USAID, is USAID Forward. To work with local organizations, to work with local governments, well, the vetting process makes that very hard to do, to build confidence and trust in local organizations when you, you're responsible for, for vetting their background. And, and, and environments like Somalia uh, that's a dangerous thing to do and I can see why organizations on both sides do not want to be a partner with that. So we've got to synchronize our policies a little bit here uh, and, and uh, make sure we're in sync from, from Treasury to State to aid uh, to the NSC. Um, and I think in theory we are, in practice we are not. A uh, couple of suggestions. When I worked in the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, when a U.S. Ambassador, I'm talking U.S. stuff here, when a U.S. ambassador declares a disaster, uh, the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance can begin to provide assistance. It would make sense to me as if at, at that same time a fast-track vetting system was put in place for general and specific licenses. Not that you'd get the answer you want, but you'd get a clear and pre precise answer within a discrete period of time as long as that disaster declaration is in force. Ambassadors don't declare disasters lightly. And it's, it's a serious thing to do. And it has to be done in consultation with the government. And it would seem to me that as uh, AID's special provisions kick in uh, for a disaster response, it might be an appropriate time or mechanism to have that apply to sanctions and the licenses that come with them as well. Just something to think about. And then the vetting system, it, you know, that, that's a very difficult process for an NGO to do, so why not have something like direct vetting? If you're going to deal with different organizations, uh, the NGO is not the, the one that does the vetting. It either has to be done by the State Department or the embassy or somebody else, but get the NGO out of the, 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 the mix here so that 
so that the NGOs can make, claim their independence and neutrality, which is, 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 goes by the board with the, with the vetting system as it has been used since uh, the early 2000s in the West Bank and Gaza and, and as the pilot programs and changes have taken place since. But I think there are better ways to do it. And as everyone here said, every, uh, both the NGO community and the governments have the same objectives in mind. They want to assist people, and, but they don't want to give an open, open door to terrorists. So we're, I think we're, we're all working on the same issue here. And as the report recommends and everybody talked about, I think if you get a group of state aid and treasury folks together with representatives of the NGO community, you got a lot of smart people here who can come together with some very reasonable solutions to deal with this process. And so I'm very hopeful it'll all work out. And now, uh, you know, as Dan said, it, we, we learn from experience. And we've got a lot of experience now, and unfortunately we're probably going to get a lot more. Uh, so it's incumbent on us to put our heads together one more time and uh, work through this thing till we have uh, decisions that are acceptable to both sides. And with that, I'll quit. Thanks, Ambassador Garvin. I don't want to put Ambassador Freed on the spot, but I am going to put Valerie and Jan on the spot and just respond specifically to what Ambassador Garvin's suggestions were. And I might also put Sam on the spot and just ask the three of you to respond quickly in just a minute or less to what you thought about Ambassador Garvin's uh, suggestions as a way forward. And then I'm going to put a, pose a question to you, putting on your old hats on as uh, on a in a different direction. But if you could each answer that. I want to. I'm watching. I'm watching out for my friend. Are you, okay, then maybe I'll maybe I'll ask you to if you if you're open to responding to that. I'd I'd love to hear your your take on that too. Then please. Okay, but please, uh, Valerie, if you'd go first. Like it, like it's going to be open mic night at the uh, at, okay. at CSIS. It's, if if it's not working. Is that better? Yes. No, okay. okay. Um, I mean, I think the people who can most um, effectively respond are our NGO partners that this would apply to. But I think it makes a lot of sense for us to, you know, explore any ideas or possibilities that would help us to negotiate this terrain. Okay. Jan? Um, indeed. I, I mean, if I've understood it correctly, in the U.S. Um, constitutional practice, as in most European constitutional practices, there is executive authority to grant exemptions for humanitarian actors and or specific, uh, in specific crises in the face of acute humanitarian emergencies, like Syria today. And I mean, Syria is, is a, you know, I would in a nanosecond declare that now for Syria. But we really need to get in with to, to the civilians there and with all of the regula regulations with, our, with all of these donors, we may be ending up with such a mess that we will, historians will really criticize us for not reaching the people in, that, in, 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 the, in the greatest need. Can I just say one other thing very quickly about sanctions regimes, yeah. which is a, 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 a bigger issue, um, which is that, and this is the, the whole sort of unintended consequences <coughs> thing, which is that even with humanitarian exemptions in sanctions regimes, what you find is that particularly major corporations, they sort of self-select out because they worry that they will somehow be punished despite the humanitarian uh, exemption uh, and not be allowed to practice in certain jurisdictions. So in all kinds of places, we're finding that you know, people can't get health, uh, uh, materials and facilities and all sorts of things, um, not because they're not able to apply the humanitarian exemption, but because they are fearful that through having a financial transaction with a particular country, they're essentially going to be blackballed. Sam, I'm going to give you a chance to also chip on. No, I, I, I think after five years of, of open, frank, and candid dialogue with AID, State Department, and others, um, I think there has been a, a, 
greater space for a common understanding of how to wrestle some of these challenges. I think the State Department's move towards direct vetting, AID's move towards direct vetting have reflected that. I think the challenge is, as we uh, saw or see currently in Afghanistan, is actually a move away from direct vetting towards uh, a, an approach of vetting uh, that was sort of counter to what we've worked out over a five-year period. So I think this, this local imperative to get it right, uh, we may find it getting it right in Washington, but I think our challenge is how do we do this on the ground? And just one last point, the challenge of timeliness. From a humanitarian perspective, you're talking about needing to move very quickly. And if you're finding your organization and legions of lawyers in your organization saying you could step forward because of this interpretation, but you can't step forward because of that interpretation of US policy, you find organizations unable to move and that ultimately counts lies. Oh, okay, Dan. Um, I had a couple of um, reactions. One, on timeliness. Um, that is critical. We have gotten much better. I think the US government has gotten much better. I won't claim uh, that we've that we are perfect in that respect, but there is no problem at all in principle with fast reactions. I think we've done that. Um, we've proven we can do that. But my practical suggestion is when a situation arises, um, let's deal with that in the moment rather than have an abstract debate. But I accept the, the principle that timeliness responding to humanitarian disasters is important. Um, humanitarian exemptions. Again, this is most effective on um, a case-by-case -case basis with the understanding that it has to be timely. That's our view. We, we, you move fast, you move in a way that's appropriate to the situation. I cited a couple examples where we've done all right. Um, the issue of vetting. Um, okay, there is a big uh, a whole history on this and there could be a subgroup um, easily devoted to it and, and the issues it raises. I'm not sure that I accept the, um, the stronger characterizations that uh, vetting undermines humanitarian programs, um, that it is untenable for an NGO to participate in any kind of vetting. Um, I'm I don't know that, that bold statements of principle are the best way to approach a process which should leave room for practical solutions. Now, that said, um, I realize that vetting can be, uh, can be difficult, but I also realize that um, if that some of the bad, the bad actors are going to look with suspicion on, on any NGO that receives money directly or indirectly from the United States. So if an NGO is receiving money from the United States, it already has an American connection in the eyes of someone inclined to look at the American connection as um, damning. Uh, therefore, you're, we're, we're dealing with um, the details, so let's deal with that and try to resolve it as best we can. Um, the, the issue of legal uncertainty is one I'm familiar with in different contexts. There I accept the need to work with um, either corporations or <coughs> NGOs to give them as straight an answer as we can possibly give them. There, um, Jan England made the point about trust. Trust has to work two ways also. Um, lawyers hate giving promises in advance. But when I don't know the case, I can't think of cases where the Department of Justice has actually gone after legitimate NGOs. Now, look at the track record. Uh, we do exercise decent judgment on these matters. Um, 
the trust should, building trust doesn't happen by itself. It happens through honest dialogue. Um, it means getting policy people together um, with lawyers in the room, um, but getting the policy people together, okay? And more discussions just like this. Okay, I want Bill, Valerie, and Jan to respond to Dan. But before, before they, you do, I want each of you, each put your hat back on having been in government. You were in the UK government, you were in the Norwegian government, the US government. And let's say, let's fast forward six months and there's an exemption in say Syria and an NGO on the ground in, as part of its operations by mistake or by some other, there's some sort of a boo-boo that happens, something bad happens in terms of one of, some bad guy group gets money indirectly and you're called up before the House Appropriations Committee and or you're called up in front of the, the equivalent committees in the UK or Norway. Treasury Select Committee. Right, this, <laughs> and so what, what's your answer to, um, to somebody who may not be that exercised by the humanitarian set of issues, but may be very exercised about the counterterrorism issues because it hits a lot, oftentimes a lot closer to home and has a hard time understanding why, why hard working taxpayer dollars are going, somehow are ending up in the hands of bad guys. So, Bill, I know you want to each respond, why don't you each respond to Dan's comments first, but then at the end of each of your comments in responding to Dan's statement, I want you to then pivot, mm -hmm. and just spend a second, spend 30 seconds talking about what's your answer and it, it, if the answer is, well, there's a little bit of leakage and that's just the way the business works, I'm not sure that's going to sell. Now, I'm not sure I can take that home to my parents at Thanksgiving, uh, which is next <laughs> month, and say, well, you know, I'll please keep supporting the 150 account, uh, but that there's some, there, boo-boos happen and we just got to live with it. I don't think that's a sellable premise in this, in this day and age. So, Bill, why don't you respond first to Dan's comments and then pivot and answer my, you're on the hill and you're being asked to testify and what's your answer? I'll figure out how to pass the buck on that one. <laughs> Blame somebody else, right. Just a couple of comments and, and uh, you know, I've, I've worked on this system, uh, uh, these issues from, from uh, both sides for a long time and I understand how difficult they are. I would argue though that being a U.S. organization does in fact uh, put you at risk a little bit, but it's not the same as being intrusive into somebody else's business. I think that's a little bit different mm -hmm. and that, that maybe goes a step or two too far. So I, I, I guess I disagree with you a little bit uh -huh. on that one. The other issue is uh, you mentioned a couple of times we ought to deal with this on an ad hoc basis uh, and each system is unique. True enough, but I think what would also be helpful is a process that people do not have right now to work through. So you got to deal with each one separately, of course. But there has to be a process uh, to, that people are comfortable with and know about and can engage in to get to, to that too. So I, I, a little bit of both. I like uh, that. And uh, now this other question. <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, uh, one reason is there are people who fear, feel very strongly on both sides and no matter, no matter what you say, you're not going to change people's mind. And so that, that's sort of a given. But if, if this sort of situation came up to me, I would want to know, first of all, very clearly, if this was a mistake and if it was a small amount of resources, it should be taken uh, with an understanding of how humanitarian assistance works everywhere. I don't care where you're working in the perfect setting. If you're delivering food, you're going to lose a, uh, a few bags here and there, a small percentage of it, and you're always going to have that happen. And if it's, so if it's, if it's a modest amount within what normally happens anywhere in the world, I would argue that it, it's not a serious issue. But the NGO is incumbent upon them as soon as they find out about it, if it's more than just a passing uh, thing like that, uh, they've got to investigate it and inform the authorities and work very closely with authorities on this as well. Um, I wanted to, to take us back s slightly because um, I think that the issues we're grappling with are both practical but they're also cultural. And the reason I say that they are uh, cultural is because we have to, uh, and it comes back to a point that I think you made, Dan, which is about stovepiping. Mm -hmm. yep. So if you have a situation where, you know, as someone who is a trustee or on the board of an NGO, you feel that you can become personally liable for the decisions that you are taking with respect to humanitarian response, 
it puts a whole new dimension on the decisions that, that you are taking. So the issues around accountability and everything else become about a culture in which you are just fearful that you are going to be fingered for the decisions that you take, not necessarily by USAID or something, but by another bit of the government administration that hasn't had the conversation with those guys over there that have said, actually, we think that's OK. But you don't actually know, given, and you know, I come up uh, from a country where uh, you know, the judiciary says, we are completely independent, and you guys have, you, know, you can't instruct us. Same here. So culturally, you can get all of the, uh, um, you know, all the bits of the administration say, the bits that sort of matter in terms of giving the money and so on and so forth, but the other bit that may take you the co to court, you don't have that reality of being told that it's okay. So that is a huge issue. Uh, if you are on the board of an NGO that's raising money and you're trying to do good and then you're you know, basically your lawyers say, because their job is to look after your back, their job is to say to you, actually, we're not sure about this. So this creates a huge tension and uncertainty. So we can do all of this practical stuff in a way. I mean, I'm not making it sound as if it's, we can do it tomorrow, but we can do all of this work on a practical level, trying to, 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 to discover which bits we could work. It doesn't fundamentally take away the fact that there's a piece of legislation against which you could be held accountable in a court of law and you actually don't know if you have anything to hold up and say, this protects me. Um, on your second uh, uh, point, um, uh, uh, I'm a politician that's always believed in you have got to talk the public through the complexity of political decision making. I've never been one of those people that thinks, you know, you stand up there and you say it's all okay. And I know that there are people who come from that shade of politics. I do not. Um, so, uh, and it's not, it's not something that necessarily my colleagues would agree with either. So in the UK context, I, I've been a development minister. I've made decisions that have been unpopular. I've always gone out there made it absolutely clear why. So I would be, when I made the decision to give the money, I would be saying, remember guys, this is a war zone, it's really difficult. I would try and think of a couple of UK specific examples that people might be able to relate to. So when six months down the line, I'm called in front of, you know, there's a presenter called Jeremy Paxman who basically just says, why did you do that? Um, you say, I made it in the full knowledge that this might happen. There are people who are dying. I know that the British people, uh, as I do, care about them. I do everything I can with our partners to protect British taxpayers' money. Um, I have to tell you, I told you six months ago, this, it doesn't mean it's going to save me. I could be axed the next day by the Prime Minister. But that is always the line that I think you have to take. The public aren't stupid. They know that operating in a war zone is complex. They see it all the time. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean it. Right. No, no, this but is I, right. Yeah. This but is right. I have to tell you, You're I did right. not get the sack as a politician, but it's an everyday reality. You right. could. I, I could <laughs> you not, can. I could not agree. I could not agree more. I could not agree more. Um, the, um, there is indeed a very big difference from taking uh, U.S. money, which we proudly do and which we would like to see more of. It's, uh, U.S. is the biggest donor. It's the most important donor. It the, it's the has been the standard setter, setter now for a generation of, of humanitarian uh, uh, relief. But it's a very big difference from us to take money to our Kenya operations and to ask our people in, in in the front lines in Dadaab camp to say go and find out the name of the father of each of the latrine diggers you know their the number where they come from where they live etc and hand it over to this superpower so that they can give it to their intelligence system it's 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 a it's it's crossing the rubicon and i i think what we say in this report is that there are some donors who are 
really uh, 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 concerned with terror creeping up in all of these places and say, listen, organization, we got to sit down and you need to explain to us your quality control, your monitoring, your evaluation, your vetting, your, 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 your on-site hands-on programs. And then we say, well, it seems that you, uh, Mr. Olsen and Mr. Peterson, have to go back home and say, you need to do your ho homework. But these three organizations are actually so fine that we trust you with our uh, taxpaying money. That's the kind of a, of a dialogue you need to you, you need to go into and and and, and discontinue. Um, but both the vetting system, I think the material support clause is also very dangerous. And I just give one example. If now a doctor, in uh, as I've understood this now, um, the material support provisions say that you can hand you can't give medicine to anybody now. That is exempted. But if you would treat, if a doctor would treat a person that actually was a wounded Al-Nusra soldier, it turned out, he or she could be punished. I mean, it's, it's, it's in the law, which is incredible. But that, that is, but please check, I, I thought so too, I, I reacted like you. It is, it, it, it is there already as potential material support. And it is an issue in, in, in Syria. If you can alleviate affairs in this, it would be good. Um, for, I, have to really discuss it. I would. I I don't let the lawyer, your lawyers' worst scenarios. Die. Okay, I, I've good. Learned. Uh, and that's what I hope. Uh, and you are alleviating some of my fears. Finally, the message to <laughs> the message uh, to uh, Congress and to. Thanksgiving uh, at dance. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I all invited. No, I, I think we also have to say w w we are doing emergency humanitarian relief here. We're we're digging latrines. Uh, uh, we're not assembling stinger uh, missiles or anything. We're digging latrines. It's a, it's a very apolitical thing, I would say. You know. Try to go to the toilet here. Is it a political statement? No, it, <laughs> it, it's not. It's so, so I think it's also a, a, a kind of a, a thing to say, these are blankets, these are baby food, this is catch-up classes for refugee children, and so on. Um, and we monitor it on site. I think there is something in this, un there is this unintended thing that you think it's transfers to all sort of shady groups. It's doing life-saving emergency relief. And, and also, uh, yeah, message to the, to the table is, do you want to have more bureaucracy for these uh, humanitarian workers in the field, or do you want them to really concentrate on doing life-saving work? What we're ending up is doing a lot of, you know, reporting, uh, you know, vetting, uh, and mon you know, um, to to, to report on all of these uh, pr procedures uh, in addition to the actual quality control of seeing that the, f the, the, the emergency relief gets to the beneficiaries. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take two or three questions. If people, we're going to get a reward for their brevity <laughs> and trying to frame it in the form of a question. I'm going to ask people to identify themselves, speak briefly, and we can get two or three thoughtful questions so that the panel can respond. I know there's a lot of people who have a lot of opinions and want to share, but let's, let's self-manage uh, and go for brevity, okay? So let's see some hands. Okay, I'm glad the admonishment worked. Okay, so this woman back here, this woman here, and this gentleman here, okay? These three. So this woman here, the woman had a hand back here, this woman here, and this gentleman here, okay? Uh, Lauren Plock Blanchard with the Congressional Research Service. A question for you on best practices. In Somalia, um, Al Shabaab was taxing um, food aid coming into its areas. What uh, have been sort of the best practices learned from that effort? How do you deal with taxation of food aid? Um, some organizations, in order to continue operating, found sort of a workaround, but it still really ultimately ended up with somebody collecting taxation from a trucker with food in it. Um, at a checkpoint, you know, there, there was sort of a, um, a layer of removal, but how do you deal with that? Okay, I'll get this person, and you're going to get that, the gentleman back there, please. Hi. 
Um, Melanie Nezer with HIAS, and I just want to say, um, this actually links into what I wanted, my comment was actually Mr. Eglin is exactly right. Um, the, uh, the bars to admission, the terrorism bars actually do include providing medical support or any kind of medical assistance. That's been in the law for 10 years and it's actually barred refugees from admission for 10 years until a year ago where we were able to get an exemption. And I just want to say the, the, the other angle of this is that this does have an impact on refugee resettlement around the world. So all the humanitarian assistance that you're afraid of um, providing also applies to refugees who seek admission to the United States and then has an impact on that as a protection mechanism in other countries. So I just want to say, as you go through thinking about an exemption process, talk to those of us who have been working on this for 10 years with refugees, because we have dealt with DHS and state and DOJ, and may be able to actually coordinate with you a little bit on this. OK. Uh, thanks for the panel. Th my name is Blake Selzer. I'm with CARE. Uh, so we do humanitarian work and have dealt with this issue. Um, but I had a quick question for Ambassador Ford and anyone else on the panel um, mentioning the legitimate issue of stovepiping and the bureaucracies that are involved. Um, do you see the process, that ha has it improved significantly since 2011 in the Somalia famine? And um, is there, do you think that the process currently, is there enough of a formal structure, tax force, et cetera? And um, finally, I, I agree your point on establishing trust. And I, um, when we were trying to get into sou southern Somalia, and um, and we had many meetings with uh, OFAC and others. Uh, I'm a policymaker, so I said, hey, they told me that they've never prosecuted an NGO, so don't worry about it. But our attorneys, that didn't quite uh, cut it with them, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so why don't we just go across the, the panel and respond to any or all, and I suspect we'll, we'll cover those three. Bill, why don't we start with you, actually? Well, I don't have a, a whole lot to say on both issues, so I'll pass. OK, Dan. Um, with respect to stovepiping, the, uh, the general answer is, yeah, we've gotten it better, but I'd want to be modest about that. Um, we'll know how much better we've gotten it when we're trying to work the next emergency issue that's coming along fast, and then we'll see. So it's a, f it's a fair question. Um, we are much better than we were five, six, seven years ago. I mean, there's no question there's been a, a, a change of culture uh, which started around then. Um, with respect to, um, look, legal risk, uh, you need input from your lawyers and then you're going to make a, a decision. There's just, I, I'm struck by the irony of organizations, including the U.S. government, uh, that accept risk, do our best to mitigate it, but we accept risk out in the world. And in Washington, um, there's nothing more frightening than a lawyer furrowing his or her brow. Um, but it's important to demystify these issues and to be able to have honest conversations so you know what the environment is. If my advice is to, to you and, and the others is don't ask for something no lawyer can ever give. Ask for a reasonable history, ask to understand where people, were, where we're coming from, um, and then make and then make a judgment, and that will require a habit of dialogue and honesty. Um, look, a to cite a, a real world example in Burma now we are in the happy position of moving slowly, carefully, methodically away from sanctions, and we are reaching out and developing the trust that is needed among all the players to make this work. So it can be done. It just takes a lot of effort on the ground. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the refugee uh, point. We will follow up on that. Um, on this point about best practices in Al-Shabaab, the, the, the problem became that as organizations, we all said, we're not going to pay the tax. But then what then essentially happened was that they were shaking down the drivers uh, to pay the tax. So we then discovered that 
the sort of members of the local communities who were doing the, the distribution on the ground or who were driving uh, uh, the vehicles were being shaken down for tax. Um, so then organizations say we cannot, we can't continue to do this because this is putting our local people at risk. So then the local communities that the relationship had been established with turned on al-Shabaab in those communities. So that's the lesson. It goes right back to the point I think we've all been making, which is you need to be working with the communities, you need to establish the trust because then those communities um, become part of your advocacy. And they're the ones that could, and I'm not saying it can work every time and it can work in every single community, but that is the core of what this report is, is saying. And of course, you know, particularly if you work for the United Nations as I do, the UN organizations are at particular risk because the UN plays so many different roles in that country and we're all very conscious of that. But not putting our NGO colleagues who are our main partner organizations on the ground at, at risk is a key element of what we have to work for. And I think you know, all of the examples show very clearly that the establishment of that trust is critical. And I'm sure that Jan will say a bit more about that. Jan. No, no, uh, exactly what, what Valerie says. Uh, I, I, I think, uh, frankly, uh, Somalia is a case where everybody did bad uh, over 20 years. It was bad assistance, it was bad donor practices, it was bad security policies, it was bad UN, uh, US, so all, of the, so all of these, uh, you know, um, uh, you know some this, you know some that. Uh, it, it, it didn't really work. And we ended up, yes, with a system that was not good uh, and, and with a diversion, among other things. Um, and we need to learn from that. Uh, and that's precisely kind of a, 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 a dialogue <laughs> quality control. Of course, there are also dilemmas in this. W are you then willing to say, okay, these women and children will die because some of the food will ultimately be eaten by some of these militia soldiers? Uh, you know, uh, w we will probably, as uh, maybe this is a very Norwegian thing, we will probably say, yeah, maybe we'll be a little pragmatic here and because we really don't want these these people, uh, people who die. But more than anything, <laughs> we want to come around it and perhaps work with humanitarian diplomacy with the elders and others and say, can you please undermine those militia people who undermine your whole community? And that will be humanitarian diplomacy where we speak to everybody because we're in the worst uh, places on, on earth. Okay, folks, we're coming to the end. I'm going to ask each of the panelists if they want to have a 30-second closing thought. I'll each give each 30 seconds to give a closing thought about this discussion. I'm going to start with you, Bill. Well, just one comment that we really, is not part of the study and we, we haven't really talked about, but I th think we ought to also remember that these counterterrorism measures also ref affect remittances. And certainly in the case of Somalia, a billion three a year, which is far much more than the international community provides in assistance. And if that stops, which it seems to be doing, uh, that raises the urgency of providing more humanitarian assistance and makes the situation worse. So just an observation that part of the equation also is a remittance issue that affects all of our work in the humanitarian area. Dan, I'm going to give you the last, last word. I'm going to have Valerie and Jan go, and then I'll have you speak last. Valerie. It's going to become more, not less complicated um, as uh, crises become more complex and intertwined. So this is a conversation that where we're going to be finding solutions in particular places, but where the policy challenges, I think, will become greater, which is why starting the dialogue now is so crucial. Jan. Well, um, uh, I, w I will end on the optimistic note that we do now have um, a dialogue established many places. Washington, D.C., we had events in, uh, in London, in Rome, in many of the other places with the donors, with the NGOs, with the UN. And OCHA and NRC are proud to have initiated uh, much of this. And, uh, and since we have the same goals, which is to, uh, to fight terror, and help people in a principled, impartial, humanitarian um, 
manner, according to age old humanitarian principles, I, I, I think we will dig ourselves out of this hole which we have now uh, temporarily ended up in, in some of these places where we see that we have currently big uh, problems. Okay, Dan, the last word. I'm heartened by the level of the discussion that today and the fact that everybody recognizes that we're in the that we're, we've got to go through the process of balancing um, different objectives in a real world situation to do it seriously, to do it fast. Um, this, is, this has been an excellent discussion. It should be the foundation for further dialogue, but also a basis for solving problems on in, in ways that help us achieve our shared objectives on the ground. Please join me in thanking the panelists.